Hi everyone to another session of the San Francisco Dynamo user group. If you have not signed up for our mailing list, feel free to do so by going into our blog at sfdug.org. If you're interested in volunteering and be part of a committee member, please email us at sfdug.coordinator at gmail and please follow us on Twitter. We have two great speakers today. We have invited the Woods Bagots to share their experience on working on Dynamo and computational design. We have Parties Mirmalek. She is a BIM manager for Woods Bagots in San Francisco. And we have the pleasure to introduce Brian Ringley, our remote speaker. He is a digital design technology manager at Woods Bagot. He is going to be with us on the line um, shortly. A couple of announcements before we get started. Our first design script workshop has been announced. It's already posted on the blog. It's gonna take place on July 22nd from nine to four at HOK San Francisco. We reschedule it a couple of times. Arma Halidu, one of our instructors, just gave birth and we had to uh, accommodate his time availability. So sorry about the schedule, but we're very happy for Armand. It's uh, not going to be free, but it's going to have a donation, nominal donation of $30. And the funds are going to be used mostly to secure some of the resources we need in our group. Like we want to buy a new subscription for uh, recording, Camtasia, and a microphone. Uh, it's capped to 20 people, so sign up early, and if you decide to cancel, please uh, let us know because we expect to have a waiting list. If you want to be part of the waiting list, email us. All the instructions are on the blog website. We wish a great uh, new journey for Cody Winchester. He was a former, he's a member of the committee who just moved to Gensler in LA, so he's no longer going to be with us in person. He attended our committee meetings and he was a great contributor to the group. So, uh, Cody, we wish you a great uh, new journey in Los Angeles. A um, couple of announcements too. The BIM 2017 uh, BIM conference in University of Southern California has been announced. It's going to take place on July 14th. It's a one-day event. It starts from 8 to 4. It has a great lineup of speakers, and it has a really, really good uh, topics related to computational design. It's a really bargain. It's just $55 until June 30th. The website is on the screen. If you want to sign up, it's a short trip to LA. I did this last year, and I was really happy I did because I was able to not only sit at great conferences, but had the opportunity to network with other peers in the US, in the AAC industry. Another announcement, uh, the Advancing Computational Design Conference has been announced already. It's on August 22nd through the 30th. It's at the Sheraton at the Fisherman Wolf. Uh, the website is on the line. Several members and former members of the San Francisco Dynamo Group are going to be part of the speaker lineup. Costs range between 500 to 3 grand, depending on how many days and if you want to attend the workshops as well. And so, it's uh, if you want to attend a nice local event, I think the topic is more focused on the general implementation side of computational design methods in organizations. So uh, feel free to check it out. Su so Young Lee, Jeremy Lufker, and Kyle Martin, all part of the Dynamo community, are going to be future speakers. So uh, support them by attending to the conference. Another announcement, there's a new Dynamo Fundamental Series online hosted by the Performance Network. I'm going to be the instructor. It's going to be five Thursdays 
in a row in July from 10.30 to 12th is going to be a hands-on training. So I'm going to distribute online some of the data sets to learn the software. The agenda, a quick agenda is on the screen and uh, feel free to sign up now. Again, it's all web-based. Uh, sign up if you're interested. The website is on the screen. And each of the webinars is $49. Again, this is intended for somebody who's never seen or uh, used Dynamo in the past. Our next month's speaker is Thomas Trinelli from Flux. He is going to introduce what are the latest uh, development of Flux and how it interacts with the Dynamo. And lastly, I want to thank for our sponsors. Gensler for the video conference system, ID8 for the food and refreshment, the AIA San Francisco for the place, and HOK for the recording system. All right, with that says, I'm going to lend the stage to Brian Ringley and Pardis Marmalade. Uh, I kind of compare that to the things that people tend to think visual programming is good at. Um, and I think the tendency is just that it just makes weird shit. Um, and here's a picture of the Dynamo customizer. And obviously, the Dynamo team wants to market what they're doing as being like cool and fun and making weird shapes. But it, I feel like I very rarely use it to make weird shapes per se or to make strange geometry. I don't think we really need computation for that. Uh, computation is like much more broadly useful than um, than form finding. Um, so uh, for one thing, it makes those weird shapes fabricatable. So here's a tower I worked on that had um, curved glass and different types of curvature. And we were able to analyze that tower to understand where is this tower planar? Where can this tower be cold bent? Where is it singly curved? Where is it doubly curved? And kind of translate that into um, the feasibility of getting that building done. So we're um, kind of repeatedly issuing out these these QTOs, these um, quantity takeoffs for, for pricing purposes. Uh, also, everything you see here was generated with visual programming, um, including the imagery and diagrams. And I'll talk more about just how extensively visual programming can be used beyond the typical considerations. Um, also making weird shapes performative. Uh, so here is Samri, a very kind of well-known Woods Bagot project in Adelaide, Australia. Um, so the shape was analyzed relative to its site context and the kind of environmental um, data of the area to generate a series of shaded window units. And the idea is that that building performs better. It's more comfortable. It's more cost effective to heat and cool. It's a better place to be in. So there's, there's something um, substantial about that and something user centric about that. Um, it's also good at automation and automation ranges from automating things like uh, Revit documentation is an obvious one. There aren't really great tools for that in Revit proper. Um, so the ability to automate things like sheet sets. Um, but when I think about automation, I think a lot too about model interoperability. Um, we drive a lot of our complex geometry through the Rhino Grasshopper environment and now we've relied very heavily, especially in the past couple of years, on Dynamo as a means to automate the placement um, of that geometry into Revit as Revit elements so that the building can be documented through building information modeling. Um, inducing situational intelligence, which I'm not going to go into too much detail right now because we're going to talk about that later, but what this is talking about is often we have really smart elements in a Revit model, but those elements don't necessarily have an awareness of one another or their kind of relationships. Uh, the same can be true of the scripts that we use in our models. So if I have a set of Dynamo graphs, they do really smart stuff inside of those scripts, but the scripts aren't necessarily aware of one another, can't really talk to one another or trigger one another. Um, it's also really good for data mining and visualization. Again, we think about kind of quantity takeoffs or just running like model QA, QC, where we can just get counts of things in our models as we try to manage them, anything from counts of model elements to like counts of warnings. Um, so people who manage manage BIM understand the, the need to be able to get those measurements quickly and um, instead of having to dig through the API to get it, there are some kind of handy tools in Dynamo Visual Programming to get that information. The image I've got here is actually us using 
visual programming to get information about how our designers use visual programming. So it's a little bit meta, um, which is showing um, definition count by library name. So right here it's saying that the library human by my colleague Andrew Human um, is, is being utilized in 633 current grasshopper scripts throughout Woods Bagot globally. Um, so again, like they're much broader use cases than, than even just projects, but talking about kind of firm-wide knowledge and model management. And it also makes bad software tolerable. Um, because the fact of the matter is, is Revit is not so great. Um, so, so Dynamo has actually, like, I didn't really use Revit before Dynamo existed, and now I'm willing to because uh, because it's tolerable now. This is true to a certain extent of Rhino, too. I think Rhino is a great piece of software, but there were things about it that were pretty miserable um, from a kind of, like, automation perspective. So the ability to augment that stuff with visual programming, which provides a user from the interface to a program's API is super valuable. Um, and now thinking not just what visual programming is good at, but how does it actually help designers? How does it augment designers? Uh, for one thing, it's relatively easy to debug. Uh, and this is primarily in comparison to programming, as in like compiled coding and textual programming. Uh, emphasis on relatively easy, um, but there are visual cues. There are built-in error systems to these things. So in Grasshopper, you get red for a warning, or red for an error, rather, and orange for a warning. Um, those errors do not necessarily cascade downstream. In Dynamo, if anything goes wrong, it turns yellow, and everything downstream turns yellow. So a little bit, a little bit less smart there. But both of them are very clear as to, like, well, the because data flows from left to right, the leftmost kind of node with the error is the one that, that needs to be debugged. And then you can be up and running uh, very quickly um, versus finding a, in a bug. A bug in some code requires lots of like debug runs and, and can be very slow. And again, so the paradigm here is you grasshopper warning. Um, a warning is something might be wrong. It's not sure. An error is something definitely went wrong. Um, and then in Dynamo, I, I don't know. It's always telling me I'm dereferencing a non-pointer. It's not very helpful. Um, it's kind of a running joke in the office. We, we do not know what these error messages mean. Um, but we know we did something wrong, and that's the first step. Um, you can use visual programming itself to actually then build in your own error warnings, too. This is an example of using the library MetaHopper. Um, to change the properties of these panel components. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with Grasshopper, the panel is kind of like the watch node um, in Dynamo. Um, so what's happening here is I basically have a static data set and I say my data always needs to be structured like this. If the data does not come in structured like this, that means I'm missing a panel, I'm missing like a level of my building, I'm missing a facade, there's some information is gone. Um, so it's super easy to write your own error messages, is especially critical when you're collaborating with, with others in these visual programming uh, programs and you want them to kind of know what are the critical things you should be watching out for. And this, this kind of leads to the idea of doing unit testing for visual programming um, or unit testing light where we can actually um, have a series of tests that each module in our visual programs must meet. And typically those could relate to the structure of our um, design models. Uh, visual programming also helps designers by helping them make their presentations. This is me actually using a custom um, Woods Bagot Grasshopper node, uh, part of our Wombat tool set, uh, and some of our template shortcuts for colors to adjust my background colors, in my canvas, so I could get better screen caps. So that's like super nerdy, but you can, you can use visual programming for anything. Um, Visual Program has, an, has, has an intuitive-ish, I would say, data structure that's often analogous to a building organization. So for example, if I have a building mass, it's made up of a list of facades. Each facade then has a sublist of levels. Each level then has a sublist of panels and so on and so forth. And those things can be ID'd and indexed. These can be used to actually generate um, identification parameters for elements. Uh, so facade two, level seven, panel five. Um, and then the, the ways in which that is expressed as either a data tree in Grasshopper um, or list indices in Dynamo, which operates more like traditional programming with data arrays. Um, and then once you have that kind of information, that is how you essentially leverage parametric design um, and design computation. Uh, so in this case, I can use things like attractor curves to drive uh, panel types and glazing types for this penthouse design for a Woods Bagger project. 
Um, I think arguably the most important thing here, or the thing I like the most, is the systematic translation of knowledge to design tools. Uh, basically, as you're working and solving problems, you have a way of prototyping and capturing these things. So there are a couple different ways this works. It's pretty similar between Grasshopper and Dynamo. So in Grasshopper, you've got a bit of code or a, a jumble of nodes here that I'm calling a graph snippet. There's a lot of lingo here, and I'm trying to like be specific to like Grasshopper or Dynamo, but no one calls no one calls the same thing by the same name, so it's a little confusing. Um, and then I can cluster that, uh, so I can create my own custom functionality from that group of nodes, because maybe I'm using it over and over again. Um, so I just want to have it as a single component. Um, and that's something I have now accessible to me for any project, but now I want to share that thing. So I create a what's called a user object, and I can now deploy that to my colleagues. So now anyone can use it on any project. And then eventually I might actually hard code it. If I think it's useful enough and I want that performance boost, I'll turn that into a proper um, compiled node. And you kind of get this gradient where you're, you're proto it's this culture of prototyping where you're moving from the most editable and the least deployable or the least shareable to vice versa, the least editable and the most deployable. Um, and it's really nice to be able to slowly capture institutional knowledge by working in that manner over time and as you're learning from projects. Uh, Dynamo follows a similar paradigm. You can have a little graph snippet there, a little bit of functionality. Um, you can turn that into a shareable node, and you can um, hard code that using what's called zero touch, which is actually a really nice development paradigm by Dynamo, one of the smartest things they've done, I think. Uh, they're missing a step. There's no way for me to make a custom node that is um, only existing in the document prior to making it shareable. Uh, this to me is a little bit frustrating because basically every time you create a custom node, you have to save it externally from the document. But, you know, it's, it's good enough. Uh, and then uh, it democratizes a computational worldview. So the use of this software isn't just a kind of technical aspect of the way we practice, but it's actually a way of, of seeing the world. It impacts how we think about the built environment, um, how we interpret that, and how we approach that. And it, it kind of fundamentally changes our design practices. And visual programming makes that sort of uh, critical lens um, accessible to a much wider body of designers than it would have been possible with um, textual coding. I, I code now, but I don't think I would have gotten into it without visual programming first. Um, and then, uh, speaking of the devil, um, it's an educational stepping stool uh, to kind of higher level things like textual scripting and programming. Um, but wait. A question that arises, I think, is all of this stuff I've been talking about is actually pretty useful and pretty like uh, necessary to the delivery of projects. So, you know, why does everyone have to code and does everyone need to learn how to code? So I think that's worth questioning. Shouldn't our software just be better? Why are we constantly augmenting it with visual programming and plugins and scripting and just all of this complicated shit. Why isn't the software just better? Um, there's a nice quote about this from my friend Daniel Davis, who's the lead researcher at WeWork, um, which is, you know, maybe maybe architecture, or not architecture, sorry, maybe software is just crap, um, but maybe in 20 years it'll be incredibly amazing and you won't be a coder or a design computation specialist or whatever you want to call yourself, you'll just be a person that happens to be using software. I think this is kind of an equally problematic view. I think um, it's not that like everyone's going to learn how, uh, everyone's going to need to be a coder and we're going to like need to constantly like hack and build our own stuff constantly. But I also don't think that the solution is just going to be this like one size fits all magic push button software that no one really understands. I think that's a little bit dangerous and it begs the question, how does programming actually impact our agency as designers? And I think this is something a lot of us worry about, especially in terms of kind of uh, an era of mass autom automation. Um, here's another quote here. Um, I won't read, it, won't read it word for word, but it basically talks about two ways of understanding um, transparency. One is the idea that you completely understand the inner workings of something, um, and that's what makes it transparent. The other is that you don't have to understand how it works, but you still get full use out of it, and that's what makes it transparent. So again, kind of the full spectrum from maybe like being someone who is a really good coder who like understands the nuts and bolts of our design platforms and can build custom design platforms all the way to um, just that magic like black box software where no one really knows what's going on behind the curtain, but it doesn't matter because it's just doing whatever we need. Um, 
so again, that's that's a little dangerous, and and understanding why that's dangerous is part part of that is really kind of understanding like the complex like stack that goes on behind the scenes. So to the left is kind of an old diagram actually of of the architecture of. Rhino, but like the point is there's just like a lot of stuff going on that makes developing in these softwares a bit tricky and there, there's a hierarchy to that. Um, and then to the right, there's the typical application programming stack. And these three parts of the stack are things that essentially no one in the architecture industry understands. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there who understand aspects of these things, but we tend not to tinker at this level. We tend to come in at the high level language. Uh, level, which is the access to APIs with things like C Sharp. So people who write macros or write Revit add-ins or do scripting in Dynamo or do scripting in Grasshopper. Um, most of that's C Sharp, most of that's Python. These are, these are higher level languages that are kind of more human readable and easy to understand. On top of those high level languages, then we have the user interface. So like I'm just someone who accesses Revit through the ribbon toolbar. Um, or we have the API, which uh, is the thing that says I'm going to expose uh, certain portions of the source code and allow developers who are not an Autodesk employee develop software that works with Autodesk software. Um, and then on top of that API, you can kind of communicate with the source code um, either through uh, scripting uh, or you can use visual programming. And then what I also want to talk about is this recent proliferation of custom user interfaces for visual programming. Um, typically scripting and visual programming don't really have interfaces. You could argue that they are interfaces and business logic all in one thing. Um, but there is a recent trend where it's saying, well, even Grasshopper, which is relatively user-friendly, or even Dynamo, which is relatively user-friendly in terms of coding and scripting, this is still hard for most designers to use. Most people still want traditional user interfaces. Um, and again, like then going back to the idea, well, can't you just like wrap it all in one magic thing and I don't have to understand anything about software and I can just do what I need to get done. First of all, I, I don't think you can make any kind of separation anymore between software and essentially life. Um, uh, but you definitely can't make a distinction between practicing architecture, really doing any kind of business or craft and architecture that, or, and software. That's just the world we live in. There's not really a way to turn that back. Um, and it can be problematic. Um, so in terms of agency, in terms of how we as architects direct the architecture industry, we can learn a few lessons. Um, and I think these examples may not be totally analogous, but you have scenarios where the concept of ownership has kind of gone away. Um, if I go to the a uh, record store and buy a tape or a CD um, or a record or, you know, be a vinyl, like that's something that I can like take home. That's an object I own. No one else really has any control over that object. If I'm subscribing to a music service, it can essentially be taken away or out from under me um, at any moment. I never really truly have ownership over that content. The same is true of self-driving cars. Um, that software is something that you as the consumer don't understand. You have no ability to understand it or modify it. It's controlled by the company that manufactured the car and they retain control. So it's kind of the illusion of ownership at that point. And this could happen to us with design software. Um, I think we're getting to the point where software companies have more and more and more control over the way we practice architecture. It's in our contracts to use certain types of software and operate in certain ways. Um, and you, you could argue that we're losing a lot of agency or agency is at risk in those scenarios. And again, I don't think there's any avoiding the abstractions um, and the kind of um, autonomous movement here. I think we know that all of these things are going to be automated and that we're going to create these like layered abstract uh, technical systems on top of the way we practice architecture. So we should be the ones who do that. Um, we shouldn't allow the software industry to come in and do that. I think it will be better for our industry if designers are the ones who generate those systems. And so what I'm suggesting is that, of course, the designers be also programmers and that we stop making false distinctions there. Um, and are we doing this right? So the next section, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly because I think I'm going a little bit slow through these slides. Um, so knowing knowing kind of a little bit about what's valuable about visual programming, are, are we doing it right? Um, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, visual programming existed before Grasshopper, obviously, but I think that's when it went mainstream. And Grasshopper came out in 2008. 
as something called explicit history. So that means it's about to turn 10 years old, um, and that makes Dynamo, I don't know, five or six. I, I've kind of lost track. So it's still pretty pretty new in terms of a uh, software paradigm for architecture. Um, it's got problems, though. Uh, it's got a limited computational space. You can't accomplish everything through this kind of flow of data through nodes, or at least not efficiently. Um, this is an example of a recursion library for Grasshopper where the data actually goes in a loop. So anytime you want to do a loop in visual programming, you have to set up this like very weird kind of additional library. That's something that is super easy to do with a few lines of code, not so easy to do with nodes. Uh, other examples include kind of complex conditional statements. Um, you'll see a Dynamo or Grasshopper definition that has like 10,000 like kind of greater than or equal to and Boolean filter nodes. Um, and again, like that's something that becomes very inefficient to do in a visual programming language that could have just been done in like two or three lines of code in like C Sharp or Python. Um, so I would kind of advocate for um, a hybrid approach. Um, and I actually think that uh, Grasshopper kind of did this initially. There are ways to script in it initially through VB.net and now through C Sharp and Python. So you can kind of augment your um, components with scripted components. Um, and Dynamo really latched onto this. Dynamo's always been more kind of software development centric. Grasshopper tried to kind of invent new ways of working through visual programming. Uh, Dynamo just tried to implement traditional programming paradigms through visual programming, I would argue. Um, there's certain things that are good about that, and the the whole like node to code interface and code blocks that allow for, um, you know, not only are there Python nodes, but there's the design script language, there's the ability to rapidly convert clusters of nodes to textual scripts. That's that's pretty powerful stuff. Um, so I think node to code is, is really cool, um, and it, it really pushes that hybrid approach. Um, and I think some, you know, some people uh, like Robert Aish, uh, who worked who worked a little bit on uh, design script and also worked on generative components, which was like the big, uh, the big computational tool uh, preceding Grasshopper. Um, he advocates for kind of a series of scripts that are all in blocks and interconnect. And I I think the hybrid approach actually makes the most sense, where you're using a little bit of both, where it where it makes sense, um, kind of using using textual and visual programming uh, to their respective strengths. Um, visual programming also has an issue of scalability. Um, this is, I just Googled like messy grasshopper definition and found this, and this isn't nearly as bad as the things I've seen. I've seen some really nasty stuff. Uh, and that stuff is unusable. Like I don't, I don't understand why people even bother making it in the first place because the second they close that document and go back in, they can't even like understand their own logic. Um, so it's one of those things. Um, I mean, it's kind of analogous to Rhino too, where like you can do lots of amazing geometry in Rhino because you're kind of unconstrained by like things like hosting the levels or things are only available in certain views. Uh, so you can model very quickly and fluidly, but it can also be a huge like unmoderated mess, and that happens a lot with visual programming, and it just starts to break down at the building scale. So if you really, if you start to put in, like if your LOD gets too high, you're putting in too much detail into like a skyscraper model in Grasshopper Dynamo, it's really gonna start to choke. Um, I think the solution to this is moving into something more of a linked graph solution. Uh, so I talked about this like situational or contextual intelligence, where these different visual programming scripts or graphs, I guess as we could call them, are aware of one another and can trigger one another to run. So like not everything has to be in one like single sprawling document, but you kind of, you make it modular. Um, and then those things can speak to an, each other kind of on a higher level. So there's like a hierarchy of how these things relate. Um, and in terms of organization, there are like lots of, uh, Lots of like firms have looked into the issue of how do we have like better standards for visual programming? How do we how do we organize it more? There are a lot more kind of annotation and cleanup uh, tools in the Grasshopper environment than in Dynamo. It's like pretty difficult to keep a Dynamo graph clean and annotated. Um, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, in Grasshopper, there are a lot of tools set up for that, uh, but you still have to have some kind of disciplinary disciplinary knowledge or kind of strategic approach to that. 
Um, so this is an example of like a recent um, script I've been working on that has these different layers. And you might recognize that terminology of layers from traditional software programming. Um, so there's all the visual programming that controls the UI. There's a layer for storing data. There's a layer for global logic. And then there's a layer for the business logic of the various functions in this. In this case, this is kind of an and a climate analysis tool that's creating like climate graphs, windrows diagrams, etc. You have a viewport display control and then ultimately an output control that outputs things like vector geometry and screen captures at high resolutions and things like that. You have to be like very disciplined so not only are they kind of grouped by sub function but they're in these tall columns that signify um, these, these different layers and there's no, there are nice annotations tools in terms of like grouping and adding labels and things like that but there's no kind of like interface in either grasshopper or dynamo that that really lets you work in this way you have to impose this yourself willfully um, so uh, and you can see here what we're kind of moving uh, from is like from this idea of targeted functionality like I'm just going to use visual programming to place a bunch of like spot coordinates in a in a 3d view or something like that um, to something that is a much has much broader aspirations uh, we call full stack visual programming which is essentially can I use visual programming to create entire pieces of software just like I would use a traditional development environment like Visual Studio um, and there are projects kind of in the works that are that are trying to achieve just this there's one called flow hub that I think is a well-known one that's trying to do this for the internet and JavaScript. Um, so the idea that you could be like a full stack web development and connect devices across the web and just everything is done through a visual programming paradigm. We, we may see more and more of this. Um, everyone is also waiting with bated breath for Grasshopper 2 um, to see how that also expands the ways in which we use um, Grasshopper. And especially like using it outside the context of the modeling platforms. Dynamo has really already looked at that, like in terms of Dynamo Studio. This has much broader applications and aspirations than just Revit, even though I'd argue Revit's its central strength. Um, and maybe Grasshopper moves in that direction too. Maybe it's not just about Rhino. Um, so in terms of user interfaces for visual programming, there's not a lot out there. There's kind of a class of UIs I would call published UIs where you basically specify a few inputs that you want to be publicly accessible to someone and then you can just publish those inputs and then the result of those inputs uh, to the web. So this is the Dynamo customizer that does that. Um, it's a little bit limited because uh, it's kind of, they are automatically creating that UI for you. You don't really have control over the individual UI elements. Um, so then there's another class of UIs that's a newer class that I would call programmatic UIs. And the distinction here is you design the UI the same way you design all the rest of the logic in the definition. So this is a grasshopper definition I did for like a canopy in an interior airport space. Um, and all the stuff kind of below in the white and the red is doing what I would call the business logic, is doing the design and geometric descriptions and the rationalizations of this thing. And then all the stuff in light blue above is actually um, designing that user interface, but it's linked to the logical items. So I like the idea that the UI is produced by the same medium that produces the rest of the logic. Um, this is an example of that climate tool that I'm uh, currently working on for Woods Bagot. Um, and this is, this is a grasshopper application. And the cool thing about this is I give this to someone, they never have to see grasshopper. This actually forces grasshopper to minimize when it launches because you can just engage with this entire tool set uh, through a user-friendly UI. Um, and we think it looks pretty nice too. So we like take pride in, in kind of designing our interfaces just as much as we take pride in designing our graphics and our buildings and things like that. Um, so that's, that's a really kind of cool and exciting direction for this stuff because it just means that like now anyone can use my scripts, right? I, I don't just have to like be like, well, I made a script, but only like a dozen people can use it because only a dozen people know Grasshopper. Now everyone can access that logic. And if you're an advanced user, you can still push all this stuff aside and go into like basically what I would call expert mode and dig back into the um, definition. And there's a new thing or new-ish thing also for the Dynamo environment called Data Shapes, which is has similar again aspirations here of creating customizable UIs, a lot less fully featured than 
uh, human UI is at the moment, but it's definitely a good start and a move in an interesting direction um, for making Dynamo scripts easier to share with your colleagues who either have, either can't work with this kind of type of thing or simply don't want to. Not everybody wants to learn how to be um, a coder. So then moving specifically uh, into Dynamo issues, um, this is kind of an old diagram, again, by my colleague Andrew Human, um, a couple of years old, that was kind of drawing some comparisons between Grasshopper and Dynamo, but I'm kind of like sick of that. I think it's a little bit of apples and oranges. I think they've got totally different strengths, um, and I don't really work on a project that doesn't make extensive use of both of them. Um, so I don't really see a point in comparing them, and I don't really see a scenario in which I can really live with just one or the other. I mean, I would still choose Grasshopper probably, but um, <laughs> I think the reality is is it's just good to work with all of these systems, and when you start to link these things all up together, you can you can do some pretty amazing stuff. Um, so this this subsection is called bittersweet dynamo because it talks about this how the strengths of dynamo are often simultaneously its weaknesses so a strength of dynamo is is very obviously the way it can connect to the revit api no longer do you have to do um, development or write macros you can you can access the api through readily available dynamo nodes or you can use python nodes um, or zero touch uh, to like very quickly augment your visual programming with textual coding when they don't, when Dynamo doesn't provide something for you that is available through the API. It's a mixed bag though because first of all the API is not super great, it doesn't expose everything, it's inconsistent, it's a bit archaic. Um, and the other problem is by virt, so the strength of Dynamo is the fact that it connects to Revit, but by virtue of needing to connect to Revit, basically all of those user burdens, the slow and cumbersome nature of Revit element transaction is now foisted upon Dynamo. Um, and then Dynamo becomes like super slow to use, um, especially when interacting with Revit um, by comparison to the way Grasshopper interacts with Rhino. There just isn't that baggage of the Revit database on top of everything. That forces you to often, um, or at least in my experience, it forces me to often be running Dynamo in manual mode. Um, I feel like this kind of defeats the purpose because one of the strengths of visual programming is this idea that it is, um, it is working kind of live with the model. Um, it's this just kind of live intelligence overlay that interacts with the model, that listens for model changes, that automatically updates the model based on those changes. It doesn't require you to click the run button constantly. Um, so there's something that bothers me about the fact that I'm not just always in automatic mode, um, which again is the grasshopper default. It's just always running. If something changes, then it updates. Um, so I feel like if if I'm running Dynamo in manual mode, then I'm essentially just running Revit macros. Um, you're not really, it's still useful, like still useful in a lot of scenarios, but um, you're not really taking full advantage of what visual programming has to offer over textual programming. This is also why, even though I think Dynamo, again, these things are really cool, like Dynamo Player is cool. It's got, it definitely has some use cases. Um, it's making people's lives easier. But I also call it into question um, that, like, that we would be emphasizing this idea that I am going to run a series of static scripts in tandem, and I'm like hitting these play buttons. It's it's strange to me because in my mind you should just have, if we take this image for instance, these six scripts should just always be running, and then they should also know when they need to re-execute. So there should be this kind of intelligence and this ability to listen to the document and then to know when to instantiate a change. And that way you're augmenting your model with intelligence. You're not just like running these static scripts. Um, Dynamo is also super granular by comparison to some of the conventions in Grasshopper. I, I basically said I'm sick of people comparing the two and I'm going to spend this entire presentation comparing the two. Um, but uh, so like if I deconstruct a plane into its origin, x-axis, y-axis, and normal, those are four different nodes rather than just doing it as one node that has four outputs. So I got so frustrated that I just wrote my own custom component that would do that um, in our Wombat toolset for Dynamo. Um, but then I realized that there, there's kind of a reason for that, obviously. The people who develop, it, who develop Dynamo are, are pretty smart, and you know they've put some thought into this. And one of them is it plays really well with node-to-code when 
each uh, method or each function available through these nodes um, are individualized. So you can see the top, even if you don't understand anything about design script, um, and uh, by the way, if you don't know what node decode is, uh, node decode is when I can just select a bunch of nodes in a Dynamo graph and it will automatically convert them to textual code in a code block um, in the design script language. Um, so you can see the Wombat one with the multiple outputs, like even if you don't understand design script, you can see that that's a lot messier. You're, you're getting something like a lot weirder out of the back end. Um, so uh, that's great. Uh, and you can, you can still kind of, it would be nice if it still worked with multi-output components, like you can still kind of access um, output. So in this case, I just want to act that's the O or origin output of my plane deconstruct method. Um, every time you make a custom component, there's also a textual method that's available to you for scripting. So everything in Dynamo that exists as a node can also exist as um, textual script, uh, which is which is there's some really nice parity there. So if I just want to access the O output for one object, I can. If I try to do it for a list of objects, um, I can't. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. It returns a null value. So I have to use something called a try get uh, to run through my dictionary. And the dictionary is a collection of outputs. And all of this gets like very, very nuts. Um, but the point, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. So granularity makes for better node to code. It's a little bit limiting in terms of its use um, in visual programming, it's annoying, but then it has these benefits for the kind of auto conversion of node to code, which is very valuable. So room for improvement, but like a really interesting way to, to be able to seamlessly go back and forth between um, visual and textual um, scripts. Um, and I would say like a general criticism I have, and I mentioned this before, is Dynamo's textual programming masquerading as visual programming. I feel like the mission of Grasshopper was to go out and to understand how visual programming could make design computation more accessible to designers. And Dynamo is just how can we make visual programming adhere to the strict standards of existing textual programming paradigms, um, which is also part of what makes it hard to compare the two because they just operate so differently. Um, they both have like nodes and wires, but I feel like sometimes that's where the similarities end. Um, so Dynamo has opened up design computation to a bunch of building information modelers people outside of the kind of Rhino ecosystem. Um, and on one hand, that's obviously really great. We have more people who kind of get that, get that critical lens um, in, in how they design. But there's some kind of weird downsides uh, to that or potential downsides, because um, this is really the way we react and not, not kind of a natural outcome of this stuff. Um, so siloing has become an issue here. So this is DynaShape. Um, by a researcher uh, who's at the ICD in Stuttgart named Long Nguyen. Um, it's really, really cool stuff where you're interacting with physics and you can like use your mouse and dynamo and like push and pull this thing that's like simulating fabric and then like you can turn that into some building elements and document that in Revit. But this is basically like a worse version of Kangaroo for Grasshopper, which existed like, you know, years and years ago. Um, so it seems to me slightly problematic that we would be recreating the same exact stuff. Um, I would rather see people playing to the specific strengths of Dynamo and creating new paradigms um, and not just having Dynamo constantly be playing catch up to Grasshopper. I think that does a disservice to what's possible with Dynamo. Um, an argument, I think, against that is this, this desire for the mono platform. So like a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to learn Rhino. I don't want to have to learn another software. Um, and you know, first of all, you need to just get over that because um, learning software is just something we have to do constantly, and we have to be adaptable to that. Like, I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for that. Um, but second of all, it just seems downright dangerous uh, to to put all of your eggs in one basket like that. I mean, this is just like basic like economics here. Uh, which is that I think a little competition by a couple software developers is going to be better for architects in the long run than uh, one single company that controls every single aspect of what you do because it seems very unlikely that that one single company is going to work in the interests of architecture. I think they're going to work in the interests of themselves and their shareholders. Um, so, uh, which isn't to like call out software companies that work with architects as 
not being invested in the architecture industry. Obviously, that's mutually beneficial to them. But at, at the same time, it, it just goes back to my point about um, how architects should really should really be the arbiters of this um, rapid industry change and really not leave this up to the software industry to solve. I think we should be a little bit more proactive. Um, and this is this is this kind of problem at its worst too is this is an example of a project um, where we're doing a complex kind of facade that was like curving and had weird shapes and there were windows in it. I can't really show like a bigger picture of it. But the point is is it was not possible to make through the Revit API. There were there were things about it geometrically and with regards to the types of elements we wanted to create where it just wouldn't have been possible. So everything was done in Grasshopper, including all of the unrolled elevations. But then we still had to bring those elevations in as Revit sheets just because of like the contractual requirement of delivering Revit sheets. So that was so stupid. So like we solved the entire problem with, you know, Rhino and Grasshopper and we still had to link a bunch of DWGs into sheets, which we also automated. Um, I believe Dynamo was used to like automate that process. Um, like just to put it on a sheet, that was the only reason, like just so that it was on a sheet that came from Revit. That does not seem like a very um, valuable requirement to me. Um, so I think we need to rethink some of those situations when we encounter them and, and really push on the way we do contracts and the way we do um, uh, BIM execution plans, right? Those should be much more expansive than like how we're going to manage Revit models and should talk about the entire ecosystem of design computation. Um, and this is the last section here, which is saying where should we put model intelligence? So having all of this understanding of how all these kind of design computation paradigms work, ultimately how does it allow us to manage the intelligence not only of our models but of our organizations too, right? We are kind of the sum of the intellectual property we're producing, which by and large, like our deliverable as architects is not a building. We do not go out and physically build buildings except in certain design build scenarios. More often than not, um, our product is the process by which we document those buildings and then the deliverable, which is a model. Um, so this is a quote I really like um, that was posted onto the Dynamo forum um, kind of a while ago by Ian Kiao in response to some I think it was some like grasshopper dynamo like turf war bickering on the forum. Um, but he just makes a really nice point here, which is that what he likes about dynamo is that it allows the user to choose where they put the intelligence. So if they want to put a bunch of intelligence into adaptive component families, they can, but if they also want to use dynamo to control how those adaptive component families relate to one another, they can do that. So uh, the point is, is like Revit was already a parametric piece of software. Um, Dynamo augments that, but it, it just gives you more strategic decisions as a designer because there's not one way to do this stuff. And it's always dependent upon the project and the client and the deliverables and the people you're working with and the team you have at hand. Um, and that's kind of a frustration, I think, for me professionally, which is I'm often asked for a solution. And I'm like, what you need is a, is a strategy. Um, and a strategy that is going to be ever changing over time, a living strategy, something that gets discussed at the point of project establishment for each and every uh, project of that scale. So object intelligence, I think we're all familiar with. It's kind of a simple, like, uh, like a parametric, like generic model. So here's, here's a stone cladding panel that can change width and it can tilt backward and has a variety of instance parameters that basically allow us to change the shape of this quadrilateral based on a center axis. Um, and then you have situational intelligence. So there's situation, situational intelligence between like scripts, but um, here I'm speaking to intelligence between parametric objects. Uh, so in this case, um, setting the relationship between uh, window units, which were already placed in the model, and then these kind of uh, smart generic parametric cladding units, which need, then need to like size themselves according to the window layouts. Um, so elements need to understand the properties of other elements in visual programming and Dynamo specifically is like a great way to achieve that. And then there's kind of a higher order of intelligence, which is like slightly more theoretical, but I think everyone who deals with these models understands the practicality of this issue, which is the idea of systemic intelligence. Um, because uh, I'm working on a project right now, for example, that has like a dozen active or a couple dozen active probably like dynamo graphs. It has probably like six or seven like big grasshopper definitions. 
it's got a Rhino model, it's got several linked Revit models, um, we're doing a little bit of logic in the Flux environment. All of that stuff is related, but there is no way to understand how it's related, and there's certainly no way to control how it's related. We are missing this complete layer of kind of systemic control for our models, and our models have just become so fragmented. Um, we're in all these softwares and we're writing all these scripts. There's, there's got to be like a push for some kind of solution to look at it kind of at the project level or even at the organizational level to systematically manage this intelligence and to get more efficiency out of it. There are certain things um, that are going to be shared from project to project. There are certain things that are going to be shared from model to model. And all of these things um, can and should be speaking to each other in different ways. The first step to getting that level of intelligence is just interoperability um, and getting the models to be able to speak one another's language. This is a diagram showing like all of the different like interop, or not all of them, but like a ton of different interop solutions over the years, like Grasshopper plugins and then Dynamo libraries and then moving into Flux. And initially Flux only connected a few platforms and then Flux connected like a bunch of platforms and then Flux had an SDK. So like in theory, you could connect any platform that has an API. And I say I have a 10 minute warning. So that's good. I think I'm almost done. Um, so the connection part is like fairly well worked out um, and that is by and large due to what I, I think is, is the magic of serialization. Um, this is an example of me sending an image from one grasshopper file to another grasshopper file by breaking that image down into code or a string of characters and then rebuilding that into an image. And the point of that is just like, anything can be turned into these like bit streams that can then be re kind of turned back into images or Rhino geometry elements or Revit elements and things like that. So serialization is kind of the key to all of that. Um, Flux initially provided a way to share things over the web, but the problem with sharing things over the web, and especially if you're building logic in the web, right? So not just sending data to the web, but building scripts in the web that operate on the data you send to the web is that each user is essentially overwriting the other person's data because that's a shared environment. Um, so I'm kind of calling for the idea of algorithms as a service where if you have a bit of uh, logic that you've created on the web, you can then publish that as an app on the web that people can access. Um, and then like you each have different versions of the data and you're not overwriting data in the same script. Um, and then sure enough, uh, Flux kind of changed their the way they've uh, organized all of their offerings and they appified themselves essentially and now everything's an app. Um, and there's still more work to go there. You still have to create the apps through kind of a complicated SDK. You can't create them through um, Flux's visual programming language which is called the Flow. Um, so you don't have that prototyping capability that you have in Dynamo and Grasshopper where you can take bits of logic out of your um, visual programs and then convert those into components that you can share with people. Um, and I think you could argue that we've reached peak middleware, which is the idea that none of these are holistic, um, open BIM style solutions. It's just a bunch of hacks on top of hacks on top of hacks. But maybe, maybe it's not about IFC. Maybe it's not about BIM standards. Maybe some of you are cringing at hearing that. I think this this can get be a pretty heated debate. You know, maybe the future of standards are just open data schemas that can be exchanged on the web. Basic stuff, XML and JSON. Um, I don't know. Uh, and then we're also seeing a data model inversion with the introduction of Autodesk's Project Quantum. So typically we're used to this problem of trying to shove data through multiple models, through multiple pieces of software. What if there was just one holistic kind of cloud-based data set that represented um, all of our models as one Uber model, um, and then we actually passed platforms or models through that data? Um, so it's just kind of a turning on the head of the concept. This is Project Quantum kind of aims to be this. Uh, it's just still just a concept, really. Um, I like the idea. There isn't like proven software that's really gone through this. The, it's challenging because not only would you have to like couple um, kind of the inner workings of all of the design apps we use, but you also would have to couple the things that automate those apps, the programmatic control layers of those apps. 
So like not only does Rhino have to speak to Revit, but like you also have to get Grasshopper speaking to Dynamo because Dynamo and Grasshopper are the things that programmatically control Revit and Rhino respectively. Throw something like, uh, you know, Fusion uh, in there and like that can only be controlled through a scripting language that's like, uh, I think uh, Python only and doesn't have a visual programming layer, like how do you even make that stuff work? Is it really like possible to get all of these things um, kind of speaking to each other and on the same page? Uh, and then before I make a few like announcements to finish this off, I think this is the last slide, which is, um, so Andrew Human and I were so kind of tired of not being able to visualize all the relationships between all of our scripts for a particular building project. And we kind of like finally did it through Flux because Flux was what we were using to connect um, Grasshopper scripts, which are shown in green, to Dynamo scripts, which are shown in white. There was also a little bit of like other types of scripts in there in different uh, other colors. So then we used visual programming to get all of the Flux keys from our Dynamo director project directory, to get all of the Flux keys from our Grasshopper project directory, and then to draw this diagram. So using nodes as a diagram uh, here that's not actually passing data, it's just diagrammatic to show us how all of these bits of data um, were interrelated between these scripts, it was super eye-opening. Um, and we were able to like debug a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of quality control in just a matter of hours, simply by having the ability to visualize this stuff. Um, so the next step is how do we actually control this stuff? How can we set um, another like layer of parametric intelligence to these things where different scripts can adapt and update based on changes in other scripts. So I really like this like new meta level of computation that can happen. Um, and then you can see in the upper right corner there's even a little script to turn all of this into an illustrator file to make a nicer presentation image. So like I said, everything can be visually programmed if you put your mind to it. Um, all right, and then wrapping up the last slides, I just wanted to announce that uh, Woods Bagot will be releasing um, our internal tool sets for Dynamo and Grasshopper. We're actually not releasing the Wombim for Revit. Um, sorry about that. Uh, that was just in this diagram. Um, and so Wombat is our package for Dynamo and our new Grasshopper plugin that we've developed as an organization. Um, just a collection of useful tools and utilities. Um, so for Grasshopper, uh, for Dynamo, like I said, uh, a lot of like, ex again, accessing more of the API functionality that's not exposed through vanilla Dynamo. Uh, this is what the Grasshopper tool sets look like. We've also added a few extra um, nodes to Flux and to Human UI. Um, and then this is, this is actually a bit outdated. We've added a few things since this, but these are like all of the tools available in Wombat Dynamo. You might recognize some of these as being available in other packages. I'm like so sick of having to use like 10 different packages. I find at this point it's just easier to rewrite everything myself. So sorry for the repetition. Um, and then a couple announcements. So I talked a little bit about Dynamo lists and arrays, but I didn't go super deep into that. It's like a, it's its own talk. Um, Andrew Human is giving that talk at Autodesk University London in 2017. So if anyone's going to be over there, he's giving a Dynamo list masterclass um, and kind of think that list management is actually the key to mastering Dynamo. Here's an example of a really complicated way of understanding how Dynamo is managing data flows under the hood. It's super complicated. Um, I don't really understand it very well. Uh, and then Andrew and I are also giving a talk on the automation of the architecture industry at Built Europe um, in Aarhus, Denmark. Um, also, if you're attending that event, say hi to us. Uh, I touched on automation. Um, I think it's a really, really hot topic and a really important topic right now, and we should do something about it sooner than later um, if, if we want our industry to continue to exist. Um, so addressing anything from the fears of the automation of architects uh, to a case study we did, which was to test how far you could push the automation of Revit uh, through the Revit sample project, which is like a really fun project that Andrew Human led. Um, and also looking at these kind of hybrid paradigms of human machine authorship. This is Madeline Gannon, who did some research with Autodesk, um, kind of controlling robotic arms with gestures. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much.
All right, and I see I have some questions from the audience um, coming in. Uh, what language do I recommend users learn? Um, this is a super common question. I never have a straightforward answer for it because, uh, like, on the one hand, it's like, well, learn all of them. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's really kind of, it's, I think, I learn stuff just by necessity, um, and I encourage others to, like, do the same. I think it's, for me personally, my learning style, it's really hard for me to just learn something for the sake of learning it. So, like, I've just kind of always been interested in design technology and put situations where I learn that stuff. But to give a more solid answer, um, Python is by far the easiest scripting language to use, and it um, runs in almost every piece of design software. Python uh, runs in Maya, Revit, Dynamo, Grasshopper, Rhino. You can run Python on your desktop to like rename a million folders or files. Um, so one answer is don't worry so much about learning one language, just go out and learn them all. The other answer is Python is a great place to start. And then I think a good step up from Python is C-sharp because C-sharp is a .NET library that you can compile as proper uh, plugins for like Grasshopper and Dynamo and Revit. Uh, when is Wombat going to be available? I was hoping to have had it available. Like kind of the point of announcing it was like, oh, hey, we released it today, but I just couldn't get around to it. Things got too busy. Um, but I am, I am pretty sure that uh, by the end of the month that will be available online. So one good way to watch out for that is just to kind of like watch social media. Um, my Twitter name is on the screen right now. Um, and we will put we will put it on Food for Rhino, we'll put it on the Dynamo forum, uh, we'll kind of post in all of the major places when we when we do release that and like um, it's not the end all be all of like uh, Dynamo packages, but I would love to hear people's response and like what people think is useful and, and what's not useful so we can continue to develop that kind of stuff. I think we've we've benefited so much at Woods Bagot from other people developing and sharing tools, we thought it was really important that we share our stuff too.